Imagine for a moment that you are a young flight controller sitting at your console in mission control. A Saturn V has just lifted off from the Cape and is thundering towards orbit with its crew of three aboard. Suddenly the spacecraft suffers an unknown event and it loses both its primary power source and guidance equipment. The general air around the control room and in the spacecraft cockpit is what just happened? The clock is ticking and with each passing second of uncertainty the mission is in danger of being aborted. At this moment the flight director turns to you and asks over the comms That's the responsibility that fell on 24 year old John Aaron's shoulders in the high pressure situation encountered during the launch of Apollo 12. Did he buckle under the pressure or did he come up with a solution that saved the day? Let's find out. The crew chosen to make the second lunar landing attempt was Charles P. Conrad, the commander, Richard Gordon, the command module pilot, and Alan Bean, the lunar module pilot. They were all Navy men, something reflected in their mission patch, which contained the Navy colours of blue and gold and had an American clipper ship sailing boldly over the site chosen for their landing on the Ocean of Storms. On the 14th of November 1969, they were ready to start their mission to the moon. If the previous crew had felt the enormity of the task bearing down on their shoulders, then this crew were relieved of that historical burden. In any account, the mission commander was the kind of man who brought humour to a dangerous undertaking. The joking had begun even before the crew had left the crew quarters. Sitting down to breakfast, the crew were joined by Thomas Stafford, the chief of the astronaut office, and James McDivitt, the manager of the Apollo spacecraft program. Also in attendance was a large also in attendance was a large toy gorilla, dressed in overalls and wearing a crash helmet. Don't forget to subscribe so that you know when a new video has been launched. With the less than perfect weather conditions at the Cape, the crew left the crew quarters for Launch Complex 39A. This is Apollo Saturn Launch Control. The weather conditions as reported on the last announcement, that is we have a top of this weather front of about 23,000 feet. A uh, very low uh, turbulence associated with it. Pete Conrad has just reported back. Sounds good to him. Well, we are go for Apollo 12 at this time. At 11:22 a.m. Eastern Standard Time, the countdown reached zero, and the Saturn V left the launch pad on its seven and a half million pounds of thrust. One, zero. All engines running. Commit. Liftoff. We have liftoff. 11:22 a.m. Eastern Standard. As soon as the rocket had cleared the launch tower. Control pass from the Kennedy Space Center to Mission Control in Houston. Just a few seconds later, the rocket disappeared into the murk of the low-hanging clouds and headed straight into danger, testing the knowledge and the nerves of the team on the ground. Conrad would later say of the launch, the flight was extremely normal for the first 36 seconds, and after that it got very interesting. As the rocket climbed through the electrically charged clouds, it induced two lightning strikes that travelled down to the ground via the rocket plume trailing behind. This theory of what happened is backed up by Bruce McCandless, who recalled, I was standing on the ground when Apollo 12 lifted off. It was an overcast day. It really wasn't a thunderstorm. It may have been an electrodynamic effect from the charged particles of plasma of engine exhaust, literally discharging into the cloud perhaps a self-induced lightning strike. The first lightning strike hit the Saturn V launch vehicle at T plus 36 seconds and took the command module's main electrical system offline. Luckily, two of the command module batteries were online and these provided enough power for the crew to avoid having a completely dead spacecraft. The problem was that when the command module stopped drawing its power from the fuel cells and started drawing it from the batteries, the power dropped temporarily from the normal 28 volts used during flight conditions to around 18 volts. This decrease in power affected the equipment sending telemetry to the ground. The second lightning strike hit at T plus 52 seconds and resulted in the loss of the inertial guidance system. Looking at his eight ball altitude indicator, Conrad could see that it was displaying movement that did not reflect that of the spacecraft. The Saturn V on the other hand was quite happily continuing on its way because its instrument unit was separate from that of the spacecrafts and was still working and keeping the rocket on course. With a control panel full of warning lights and a ball giving spurious readings and his lunar module pilot reporting the loss of the primary power supply, Conrad would later recall that his main concern at this point was winding up in orbit with that dead spacecraft. 
With the launch escape system still attached, Conrad could be forgiven for hitting the abort handle to send the spacecraft safely away from the Saturn V and back to Earth on its chutes. As the rocket continued towards space, the ground was not reporting any veering away from the launch track, something that was backed up by Gordon, who reported that his 8-ball was working okay because it was receiving its information from a different source to Conrad's. Deciding to roll the dice, Conrad did not initiate the abort system because he didn't want to be the first person to man-rate the Apollo launch escape system. Instead, he reported everything that was going on in the hope that things would just hold together long enough for the ground to work the problem and come up with a solution. Okay, we just lost the platform, gang. I don't know what happened here. We had everything in the world drop out. One. Three fuel cell lights and AC bus light. Fuel cell disconnect. AC bus overload. One and two. Main bus A and B out. Gordon would later state, We never anticipated anything like that. It was not part of the training syllabus. Simulations didn't even come close to it. Bean would say, here's my chance and I don't have the slightest idea what to do. As he stood, the rocket was sending the spacecraft into orbit. The spacecraft's fuel cells had gone offline and it was now drawing its power from two of the onboard batteries with one battery in reserve. The question before the ground was, do they continue into orbit and possibly end up with a powerless spacecraft or do they abort the mission now and bring the crew back to Earth? Before anything could be done, they needed to know what condition the spacecraft was in but this was going to be impossible without reliable telemetry. As Bean pointed out, you didn't want to start messing with anything without a clear idea because by arbitrarily switching the electrical system around, you can get yourself into more trouble. With the main electrical system offline, Jerry Griffin, who was serving as a launch flight director for the first time that day, turned to the flight controller who was responsible for the electrical distribution systems and asked, How's it, how's it looking, Ecom? Ecom, what do you think? The ECOM that day was John Aaron and it was lucky for Apollo 12 that he was in duty. He would later reveal, I will tend to dig into anything until I understand it and that was the important factor in saving this mission. Looking at his console display, Aaron saw the jumbled mess of information and recalled seeing the same kind of pattern of information in the past during a test. On that occasion, he had consulted with a North American engineer by the name of Dick Brown to not only understand why the telemetry being displayed was jumbled, but what could be done to unjumble it. Aaron had found that the jumbled information being displayed was the result of the spacecraft switching from drawing its power from the primary source of the fuel cells to the batteries. Using the batteries had led to a decrease in power and this undervoltage had resulted in a particular piece of electronic equipment transmitting unintelligible information to the displays. The equipment concerned was the Signal Conditioning Equipment or SCE which normally drew 28 volts and was located in the lower equipment bay of the command module. This equipment acted as a translator by taking the raw data from the spacecraft sensors and converting it into information that could be read by the controllers. Aaron figured out that if the SCE's primary power supply was affected by a decrease in power, it would not be able to decode the data, hence the loss of understandable information. He further figured out that the solution to this problem was to switch the SCE to its secondary power supply or auxiliary source. Despite the high pressure situation going on around him in mission control, Aaron had been considering the problem before him in the brief time that he had between the data on his screen going jumbled and the request from Griffin as to what he thought was wrong. Apollo 12 Houston, try SCE to auxiliary, over. NCE auxiliary. What the hell is that? SCE, SCE to auxiliary. The location of the SCE switch can be seen in this video I took of an Apollo simulator control panel at the London Science Museum. It's down on the right hand side. When I met Richard Gordon, I asked him if he'd have known what SCE to aux meant, and he told me that as the only one of the crew trained to fly the spacecraft on his own, he knew the spacecraft inside out. At the time though, Gordon was in the centre coach concentrating on the guidance systems. It was Bean, who was the crew's system engineer, who would flick the small grey SCE switch down from the normal position to the auxiliary position. As Bean would later admit, knowing where the switch was located was something different to knowing what the switch did. He would reveal, I'm still trying to figure out what to do. Then they called to get me to throw a switch, which I did, which I didn't remember what the switch was for either. With the SCE switch in the auxiliary position, the SCE equipment started sending telemetry back 
that could once again be understood. The ground team could now see that there was nothing wrong with the spacecraft, so they instructed the astronauts to get the spacecraft back onto the fuel cells. Got a good attitude, gang. Can we copy, Pete? You're looking good. We're okay, now we're figuring out our problems here. I don't know what happened. Uh, I'm not sure we can get hit by lightning. Your thrust is looking good, Pete. Okay, I have a good GDC, and Al has got the fuel cells back on, and we'll be working on our AC buses. Right, Pete, your uh, fuel cells look good down here. I think we need to do a little more all-weather testing. It was becoming clear that the launch was still go, and the three relieved men started joking once again. S4B orbit. S4B orbit. Man, oh man. Good. 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 Once in orbit, the guidance system was realigned and the spacecraft checked out to make sure it was safe to proceed on to the moon. The only niggling worry was the main chute deployment system, but the decision to carry on with the mission was taken. Gordon said, Once we got into orbit and realigned the platform, there wasn't any doubt in our mind that we should go. Apollo 12 Houston, the good word is your go for TLI. Hoopy doo, we're ready. We didn't expect anything else. Later, as they coasted towards the moon, Conrad would ask the Capcom. Uh, say, We've got, a, we've got a favor to ask you for our entertainment tonight. Roger, go ahead. Uh, you, you got the DSE tape, don't you, of, of the launch? That's affirmative, we have it. Well, uh, we want you to play it for us tonight before we go to bed. We're still up here laughing over trying to remember all the things that we said and did. But we want to hear it tonight before we go to bed. You want to relive that twice in one day. <laughs> yeah, you better believe it. Conrad and Bean would land on the moon on the 19th of November and conduct two moonwalks before rejoining Gordon in lunar orbit and heading back to the Earth. The final hangover from the lightning strikes was resolved when the main chutes deployed and lowered the crew to a splashdown in the Pacific Ocean on the 24th of November. The mission was over and it had been a stunningly successful flight to the moon and back. Now since you've watched this far in the video I want to give you a bonus. After the mission the all Air Force backup crew of Scott Worden and Irwin made a short film making light of the launch drama. Second. Apollo Saturn launch control. We've just passed the 49-minute mark in our countdown. We're now T-minus 48 minutes and 53 seconds and counting. The count is going well, but the weather appears to be deteriorating. However, we are still counting. 47 minutes, 30 seconds and counting. The Apollo 12 spacecraft and that Saturn V launch vehicle at Pad A all still going well at this time. Pete Conrad has uh, completed his guidance and control checks in the spacecraft. With a precision that exemplified the entire mission, the three adventurers of Apollo 12 lifted off. Fuel cell lights and AC bus light. Fuel cell disconnect. AC bus overload one and two. Main bus A and B out. As for John Aaron, he would go on to play a pivotal role in bringing the crew of Apollo 13 safely back to the Earth. But for his calmness under pressure, he would quite rightly earn the title of Steely-Eyed Missile Man, and the words SCE to Orcs have now gone down into spaceflight lore. If you've enjoyed this video, then hit the subscribe button so you don't miss any future videos, and thanks for watching.